Okay, so uh, when I was talking to Liz about this project and what I might contribute, we were talking about proxemics. And it was interesting to me because I both knew the term and I didn't know the term. And I, thought, I like neologisms because it suggests a kind of fuzzy and the kind of bleeding edge of thought. And I've always been interested in the bleeding edge of technology. So that was fascinating to me. And I, went to, and I wanted to know what people were using this term to describe and how. Um, because it, wasn't so, it was something I knew and didn't know. That kind of uh, vague familiarity was uh, interested. So I started with the definition. I went straight to the OED, uh, which told me that it was a branch of knowledge that deals with the amount of space that people feel necessary to set between themselves and others, which I thought was incredibly interesting. And when I show you some of my work, you'll see how I've been interested in space for a long time. Um, I'm very, the, the distinction between space and place is something that I've talked about quite a lot in my academic uh, career um, and, and how you might differentiate between the two. And, and my belief is that it's human presence and human interaction that to a large degree uh, acts as a hinge between the debates around or the identification of something as a space or a place. And I know that that's an oversimplification, but the, that, that's where it starts for me. Um, so I wanted to know a bit more. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to try to unpick that. And to do that, I ended up thinking about uh, geographic territory and physical distance. I was interested to learn that, uh, that the term proxemics is often used by organizations who are attempting to address uh, kind of um, conflict resolution. And so um, in thinking about proxemics, you might think about geographic territory and physical distance. And there's a, they, there is a really interesting framework within this notion of proxemics that I wanted to share with you. I know that it most a lot of you will know this, but I, this will frame what I say in a bit. Um, so as Liz was suggesting, territories are interesting. Different cultures... Um, have different ways of expressing boundaries and interacting with each other. In each part of the world, we have our own customs and our own ways of acting and reacting. And so the framework that proxemics gives us is just useful for considering these differences. We might think about four things in terms of territory. Primary, secondary, public, and interactive territories. A primary territory of a person is their personal space. That might be, uh, or a place, sorry, that might be a house or a bedroom, a den or a study. It's where they feel most at home. This is not yet my primary territory. I think this will become my primary territory at the university. <laughs> um, because there's a space where you can be yourself and be relaxed. It's the depth, as an artist, it's the first space on this campus. I thought, all right, I can breathe. Um, uh, secondary territories uh, are the spaces where you also kind of feel comfortable. They might be neutral spaces, like bars or restaurants or other private spaces, such as a friend's house or a club. I make no... Um, complaints when somebody suggests that the, um, the cafe opposite our building is a secondary territory for me here at this campus. Fabrica Gallery is in a way a secondary, secondary territory for me. There's public territory that's not owned by us or people we trust. It's neutral. No, well, neutral. Um, it includes streets, parks, and other places, and there may be a threat or safety there depending on the place or time. And then there's interaction territory. And interaction territory is that kind of temporary private space where I might be having a conversation with someone. So interactive ter territory can be created through interaction with another pe person in any of these other spaces. Um, it can be in a cafe or moving along a corridor. The walk and talk means that you've got a moving interactive territory, which I find really fascinating. And I think that in the final iteration of this paper, I want to talk about that. Um, it, it is, it's assumed that um, in that space, you've created a kind of private space. And my colleague Michael Bull has written a lot about the way that uh, originally Walkmans or other uh, personal media devices create a personal space bubble around us. Mm -hmm. And I think his work would um, be really interesting to consider in the context of this, the way that in very public spaces we create our own private spaces, spaces that we believe to be private, where we are experiencing things in relative privacy, but of course we're not. So it's, um, quite interesting. Um, in addition to territory, uh, another thing that proxemics gives us is a way to consider physical distance. And again, so in, um, in that context, and the questions around physical distance are the ones where conflict resolution, um, or people engaged in it, will use these kinds of elements of the framework. It, this comes from the work of Edward T. Hall um, in uh, his work in the kind of 
through the 60s and a bit earlier later, uh, specified four distance zones. And I'll just go really quickly into this. So there's there that are commonly observed um, in his work by North Americans, so my people. I, I can say that in uh, England and in Europe, the distances are different. I, uh, in my other, in my hobby life, I run a ukulele festival. So this past weekend, if I look tired, that's why, I had uh, artists from a dozen countries in the north of England. So my Italian artists and my American artists and I had a very different sense of physical space and physical distance than my British artists. So some were hugging more than others, um, which I found interesting because I wrote the draft of what I wanted to say before I went away for the weekend. And it, a lot of the notions of the types of what defines different types of distances were markedly different to me. So this is a North American perspective. These are my people. Um, you're, you might want to add a few inches to all of these if you are English. I can't speak for anybody else in other European countries. Perhaps you might come closer. Um, so... Uh, Thinking about physical distance is interesting because it is very clear that distance can vary based on cultural norms, as I've just said, and also on the nature of type of relationship between people. So, I like numbers. There's four types of physical distance. Proximity gives us two sets of four. I like that. Primary and secondary territory, public territory, and interactive territory. Intimate distance, personal distance, social, social distance, and public distance. I had to keep myself from drawing a Venn diagram because I couldn't quite figure out how it would work. I kept wanting to move things around. And that's something that's interesting to me that suggests that there's, that there's a lot to be unpicked as this project develops. Um, intimate distance in North America is from zero to 18 inches. Um, that's the zone that extends from actually touching to 18 inches, and it's normally reserved for those with whom one is intimate, as it says on the tin. In that distance, the physical presence of another person is overwhelming. So as I said, it might be more than, uh, you might want people to stand further than 18 inches away from you if you're British. I also find, again, based on my relationship with people, that 18 inches is not enough. So, um, so uh, teachers or who violate those, uh, that space with students who violate that intimate space are likely to be seen as intruders. As an, as a, an academic, I'm very, very aware of that. Um, there's then personal distance, which is from 18 inches to about four feet, and that's the zone that extends um, from kind of the, the edge of intimate distance out to about four feet away. That's the distance of kind of interacting with good friends. And this would also seem to be most appropriate for student-teacher interaction. You can see why I have this information <laughs> as an academic. Um, uh, so uh, it's the kind of space where I have been instructed uh, to... Uh, use when I'm talking to my students. So they feel that I'm engaging with them and I'm uh, interacting with them in a way that shows concern, but I'm neither too close nor too distant. The next is a social distance, and that's between 4 and 12 feet, and that's an appropriate distance for casual friends and acquaintances. And then there's public distance, which is from about 12 feet to 25 feet, and that's about uh, the idea of a kind of speaker and an audience and the notion of formality. So I, you're a bit too close to me for this to be formal, but I actually wouldn't want you to be farther away because of my relationship with you. So I think it's, the notion of proxemics is interesting because it gives us a kind of set of parallel frameworks to consider geographic territory and physical distance. I found it really interesting to have to think about it when Liz asked me to think about it and to kind of give it as a bit of an introduction. And so I wanted to do that before I talk about my work. And I hope I haven't broken the system by doing that. But if I have, that's um, something I'm also good at. So I've got a lot to say. And if I get to where I'm running over, you tell me and I'll cut stuff out. Okay, so um, how much, where am I now? 10, 20. When do you want me to stop? Because now I've got my timer running. Um, okay, you started like, you've had 10 minutes. So I'll talk for 10 minutes. Uh, you've got 20 minutes. Okay, great. I'll, I actually probably will go to 20 minutes then. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about my previous work and why I want to talk about this. I have always been interested in, as a practitioner, the spaces and the places that we inhabit and how our presence and our absence is written on those spaces. Whether it's the way that we mark buildings with uh, our accidental encounters or uh, with graffiti, whether it's those worn paths in cities and fields, whether it is the way that we dress the space in which we live, um, whether it is wayfinding signs in towns. Um, my work, uh, my most recent work has in work, um, use a process that I call re-photography, which I, I don't use as much anymore, but I've used re-photography for about the past decade. And in one of the pieces I'll show you, I spent a lot of time in uh, Samalo uh, re-photographing images that Lee Miller took during the siege of Samalo and trying to learn what 
that practice could teach me about not just how the buildings had changed, but what that told me about the photographer and her movements for, through the city, how her, the act of taking photographs changed her, and also uh, what other things we could learn about cultural change. And my current work, I'm developing a brand new project which uh, is going to be exhibited in the next month or so in a gallery up north that is also under construction that's overrun, so I can't tell you when, but sometime this summer, which is called There Are Places. And I'm working with community groups to uh, ask, and I'm asking them questions about what they remember in their community, what they've lost and what's changed. And I'm very specifically looking at the former mill towns of the north of England along the kind of uh, Hull to Manchester corridor. So I'm looking at uh, towns on those canal and river and motorway routes, on those transport routes, and I'm looking at how their spaces have changed. So, um, and that project um, is, going, is an interactive installation. And what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm using a reactive paint to uh, basically uh, work with an, uh, uh, different artists in different communities to decorate everyday objects so that your handling of those objects then triggers digital story or digital forms of stories, sounds and um, images and things like that. And we're still finishing the project, which is, I can't show you a lot of it, and I'll, but I'll say a bit more about it later. Um, so it's a very intimate project. People's interact I'm asking people to interact with the project, to drive the project through intimate interaction and by bringing the materials of the project into the, that intimate space if we're thinking about territories. So um, let me say a bit about my work so that you can perhaps learn a, more, a bit more about me. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, I apologize for the resolution. This is really high resolution screen. Um, there's been a lot of de debate in the digital in this about, mm, excuse me. <laughs> there's been a lot of debate about how in this digital age, photography I itself is being reshaped. Um, I would like to say that I don't, um, I, oh, sorry, it's, it's on its own now. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to say a lot about the debate and where I stand on it at the moment. I just want to suggest that this, the practice of re-photography, which you see examples of here and you'll see on the next screen, is something that I, uh, I have practiced in a way to explore what I call expanded photography, trying to use one form and expand it somehow, use digital media not just to um, interfere with it, but to somehow ex expand the narrative. So I've been trying to figure out what layering these two images and making them interactive in a specific way might do. I've also been trying to link it with other materials and the practices that I've developed for this piece. This is from uh, Traces of Lee Miller, that project came from um, kind of oral history practices. I went to San Malo, interviewed people from San Malo about spaces and places, found historic spaces, photographed them, layered the photographs, and then created an inter interactive space where, and I won't touch the screen, in the exhibition, you just go to the screen and touch the screen and wipe the past away or wipe the present away. So you see an interim state here. And that, and uh, I tested different ways of interaction. I also tested ways of uh, um, interacted interaction which were based on distance. So people would, uh, the closer they were, the more they would see of the past and the further away, the more they would see of the present. Um, but the, the physically touching the screen worked really well. You had to, you were implicated in this change. And when that project was completed, the response of the people involved was that they felt that there was a kind of temporal snap. They felt that they were immediately engaging with the, um, with questions about what had changed and why. They, 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 some remarked that the project made them almost daydream and wonder about these places and these spaces and, and how these physical spaces were changing and, and, um, and who these ghosts were. And that's a term that a lot of people used in talking about it. So these are just some details from that you can see. The, the remarkable thing about Samalo and why it was such an interesting pro uh, place for this project is that after the town was destroyed in World War II, it was rebuilt almost brick for brick to look like it did before the war. So the things that have changed are small, very small, um, which also says a lot about the things that people believed didn't matter when they were rebuilding. So it's a really remarkable place. Um, uh, and the other thing, it, does, it shows you because so little has changed, so much, they, a lot of these buildings have been rebuilt so clearly that they just stand as they are. So you see the presence of the motorized vehicle and the absence of the children. Um, 
So the, another piece that I want to just mention, which is one of my previous pieces, is called Impossible Geographies. And this is the piece that was at Fabrica. Impossible Geographies um, was a piece that I developed with a colleague, Patrick Meinbach, who's now based in Sydney. And this piece now lives at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. Um, but this was a project where we were trying to create a way using interactive media, basically using a series of lasers <laughs> um, and uh, custom-built Maximus P patches to develop a way or a system for an exhibition to record and recall the presence and the stories of people who came to the exhibition. And the longer you were in space, the, different, the more it would record of you and the more it would show you of people who'd come in the past. And this is it at Fabrica. We experienced this here, we were rather than using a straight wall, we were projecting onto kind of perspex screens. And the more time you spent, the more you would see from the past. And what would happen is the image you saw would kind of almost ripple and tear apart. And so the picture that you saw there was someone who had been at the exhibition in uh, Boston. And you can see him kind of starting to peer through. You see a better, uh, this is a better example of that rippling. Uh, on a, it's just projected onto a straight wall. When you first came in, it looked like a mirror. It just looked like you were seeing a reflection of yourself the longer. And as you spent more time, this is an example of what's happening in the background. These almost water droplets would begin to kind of create a mask that would then pull apart the image that you saw. That project, uh, I think at its time, I was really satisfied with it. Of course, looking at projects that are 10 years old, you kind of, it makes your tummy go funny. Um, but I'm still really interested in it. I'm interested in, in the way that technology does and doesn't uh, shape the stories that we tell. So in developing this new work, I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep using rephotography because I find it to be, um, I think I've taken it as far as I can take it um, as a practitioner. I, that might not be true. I feel that at this moment. Um, but I did continue with it for a bit. This project up north started with me trying to look at questions of uh, industry and philanthropic acts in these industrial towns. So I looked at the Carnegie libraries. Most of them are, are not libraries anymore, and most of them are in city centers that have changed radically. So this is in Wakefield, in a part of Wakefield that is essentially a kind of ghost town stuck in the middle of one-way systems. Um, but at the moment of the opening of the library, it was a completely different space. Um, as I said, I, was, I, didn't, I came to the, to the decision that re-photography wasn't the thing to you do in that space. But these are some examples. I, I developed a kind of uh, a prototype exhibition exploring different ways to look at the different representations of the, that physical area in uh, Wakefield that's undergone so much uh, change. Um, and I exhibited that at the Long Division Festival in that Carnegie Library about uh, three summers ago. And so these are just some examples from that. This is actually what the uh, punter saw on the screen. I used a similar kind of interactive map which, took, which basically took kind of um, heat signals from the room. So these are people in the space. Um, and then, so the more densely populated the space, and this was in the bar of a festival, so it would have really dense moments and really quite empty moments, would change the way that, that, uh, that the image they saw um, was represented. And it was just going through kind of onion skin layers of history. This is my colleague, David. You've arrived, David, at the presentation that is like the iteration of what you saw last time. This is the thing I'm going to hopefully write up very soon now. Um, so uh, for, so I wanted, not wanting to continue with the re-photography, I began to do some work in archives, looking at archives um, in and around that area. That led me to the work that I'm doing with community groups, getting them to bring materials into me. So I've been uh, working with the group that's behind Unity Hall up in uh, Wakefield as well, getting people to come into that space and talk about their memories of that space, the things that have happened in that space, and bringing artifacts that tell stories about that space. Um, so uh, this new project then has uh, led me to ask questions about what has changed, what has changed in these spaces and places, and how do those changes um, become a part of our everyday lives? So what are the objects? that we hold on to? What stories do they tell about those spaces? And how can those stories somehow be recaptured and shared? And how can digital media play a part in that? Um, so I, asked, I set up a series of questions for myself as an academic. I like to uh, set up kind of research questions that's, or, or just questions that I don't know the answer to and that I might enjoy working through to find, if not an answer to, then perhaps more questions. So uh, what are the shared practices in kind of working with community groups to get them to talk about 
uh, these ideas, and those for me are documenting change, responding to it, and participating in change. So to what degree are the people in these communities documenting, or what documents do they take and hold on to of change? How do they respond to it, and how do they participate in it? Or how does it change their presence in their space? How and when are digital media a part of this? I don't want to just look at our relationship with media and technology, but I want to ask how the key debates in, in uh, the area of digital media can be seen in relationship to documenting, responding, and participating in change. And I don't just want to consider on-screen archives and the internet. <laughs> I, and that's why I'm interested in more intimate interactions in this project. And then how can, a project, how can I build a project without relying solely on storytelling? I'm interested in story, and I'm interested in narrative, but I didn't want to build a project with a single story that I delivered um, as the narrator to people. I wanted to capture other people's stories and present them in a way almost curatorially, though I know that that's a really popular term right now and I'm not trying to co-opt it uh, in the way that it has been quite often. But I, w I wanted my project to present other people's narratives in a non-linear way and in a non-authorial way. Um, and that's something I'm doing now. Um, so uh, I've been doing the work with Unity. There was um, the first part of the project was a case study with them. I identified a place I'm working in Wakefield, and I'm working with community groups in Wakefield and around that area. Um, the community groups uh, vary, but they are primarily young mums. There's a, a retired minors charity that I'm working with, and then I'm also working with some of the social clubs and the old working men's clubs to try to get a spread of genders and uh, ethnicities. I'm working with them. I've uh, developed a series of rules. Um, where I ask each um, group kind of what materials they might have. I try to figure out what stories come out of those materials, and I try to figure out what stories you'll, people might tell. I interview them. Um, those rules provide a kind of economy for developing this new piece. Um, I have determined now that the project will be a kind of a uh, project which is driven by material interaction, and I'll say, I've mentioned that a bit, and I'll talk about it a bit more, and I want the objects with which people interact to be intimate, even though they will, it, those objects will drive stories which are um, delivered via speakers and other kind of more uh, digital and less intimate uh, means. Um, I, the questions I ask people are devised to try to get responses from them where they're telling me information about the materiality of the things they bring in. So I, I get them to talk about holding things and where it lives and to hand me things and to, to let me hand them back to them. And I record these interactions and I've got a small team working with me um, based out of the Art House in Wakefield to do this. Um, we engage in discussion. I try to get people to come in, in pairs and interview each other about the pieces. Um, it's, a pro it's a process that the Story Corps in North America has used and I, I used their framework for getting people to tell stories and to interview each other. Because we record them, uh, even though the interviews, the, the video from the interviews for most participants won't be used in the final exhibition, and that's to do with wanting to be very clear about permissions and understanding that if I ask their permission up front, that in the brief time I have with them, they might be more guarded. Um, I am still analyzing the footage to try to read the reactions of people in the interview settings. And so this is where proxemics is becoming a really, is a useful tool. And I'm going to go back and try to use those frameworks of kind of thinking about territory and space and, and, and go back through those video clips and ask what distances are being occupied and when those distances shift and why. Um, and I'm also looking at performance. The other, one of the things that has come out of this, and it, at the point I last talked about this, was something that was emerging. It's now actively a part of the project. I have been asking people... Uh, to tell me about the sound, what they remember, like what the spaces sounded like, because when you do, people perform the sounds for you. They make the sounds of the train and the canal and the cars going by or the children playing and something magical happens. They forget that they're performing and, and they tell you more about those spaces and places. And so, um, because my background comes from performance as well, I then am able to occupy an almost directorial position, which is what I originally trained as. Um, to kind of, in a way, get them to give me more information than they might while also not taking advantage of the situation. They, I've done some serious uh, work about the ethics of getting them to tell me about their stories and spaces, and again, that's why there's a lot that won't be included. So again, I'm working with community groups. Uh, I'm also working with a group of artists called Belay. I've set a brief which takes the same questions I'm asking and puts them to a group of artists, digital media artists based in the West Yorkshire area, and they are working to the same brief that I've set for myself to develop a series of projects that will run alongside mine in the gallery. So my project will be in a space like this, and then in an adjoining gallery will be uh, 
smaller scale projects by a number of local artists working to the same brief. Um, I'm also working with a composer, so he's been up there with me for the last month and a half recording the, these per sound performances in a way, and he's also developing a uh, composition. Um, so just a bit about this piece, uh, because again, it's a work in progress, and, um, uh, but it, uh, I, I've been experiencing different, exploring different ways of, of kind of creating a piece of interactive art which would feel more intimate. I've t put tiny screens in tiny spaces. This is from a piece a few years ago uh, that I had up in Crewe. Um, I've experimented with, with ways of project projecting onto objects. And for a long time, I thought I was going to project onto objects in a Tony Ursula way with this piece. I've uh, tried to think of different ways to use material to drive interaction. And now the piece is literally replicas of or duplicates of the everyday objects that people bring in, uh, but painted with uh, reactive paint, so that when you touch it, you're that you're giving the signal. So I've also there's a tiny bit of technology, but it's um, it's um, oh it's not I can't remember the name of it anyway. Uh, Raspberry Pi, sorry. Uh, there's, a, a lot, there's Raspberry Pis embedded in some of them so that you can get the information out. Um, we're also using sensors in some of them. But basically, when you hold these things and the way that you interact with them, they drive the story. Um, it, I'm oversimplifying it, but it's only because it's hard for me to talk about the piece in project. Um, one of the pieces that we're working with, I'll, I'll stay on that last one, sorry, because I wanted to say about, a bit more about it, and then I'll come back to the last thing I wanted to say, um, and I will actually be at about 20 minutes. Um, one of the pieces that we're working with is, um, I'll just, oops, sorry. Just to get a picture of, okay. One of the pieces we're working with is just, it's a really, it's a, a dog. I think it's like, um, it's not a poodle because it's a very British dog, but it looks like a l little long-haired poodle. Maybe it's a schnauzer, I'm not a dog person. But it's just a little China figure. But the really funny thing is that in two different cities, um, people have brought, versions of this little white porcelain dog in. And they were really popular in the 70s. I don't know why. But, and they both use them to tell stories about how the towns that they live in have become much less um, rural. And how that's, that even when the, the big mines um, were, the big coal mines were open and running and on their doorsteps were very, very loud their, their, their communities felt more kind of rural and idyllic than they do now, what with town, the boundaries of, of towns and cities kind of blurring. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is, um, the, I also am working with uh, Faceless Arts up north as well, the, which is a community arts group. Um, is I wanna work with Tony Wade, to, uh, the, the artist at, one of the artists at Faceless, to get them to paint onto the uh, replicas of those uh, porcelain figures. So we're just now waiting for a job lot of the figures to come in. We've done tests of it. So with the reactive paint, which it just looks like black paint, but in the tests that we've done, you've got a wall of decorated, por decorated or a, a kind of row of decorated porcelain dogs that you're encouraged to kind of pick up and interact with. And the way that you hold it and the way that you touch it then gives us the information to determine how much of that story we want to tell you, if any. If you pick it up and put it down, we might not. And they're not all... Um, as I said, so we're using some sensors. So we've also got a motion sensor um, uh, kind of just behind them so that we can tell your distance, your proximity to them. And that is the other vector in a way that drives the interaction. So your physical distance and the way that you handle these objects are the two um, parameters that I use to determine how much of the story you're going to find out. And for the final exhibition, um, in the summer, there's four different stations. So there's the kind of dogs and then there's another bit where we've got kind of more soft furnishing type things that people brought in. So like um, pillows and more handmade things. Um, there's another one that's plates. I don't know why plates are so popular, but plates. So decorative plates and things. And again, those you can touch, but we're, using much, we're taking much more information from how close you get to them and how much time you spend with them. Um, and uh, the thing that we're, I'm beginning to learn about the project, which is really interesting, is that the... Um, there are moments when a city changes. It either changes because of a large event, like Tour de France has changed uh, a lot of the smaller towns between Leeds and Huddersfield and York uh, in quite profound ways and in unintentional ways. And 
not all in good ways. And at moments like that, when these things occur, when these moments occur, uh, there are often bits of commemorative memorabilia and those are, a lot of those are the things that people are bringing in, but they help us to get to the stories that people have to tell about their experience of change. And so um, the last thing I wanted to say about that, and that's what I'll end on, and that should be at 20 minutes, is that the, um, and I wrote it down, so I'll just read it. So, um, remembering memory and the act of storytelling, each of these notions surface inevitably when we talk about music, digital media, or other things that have become ubiquitous and a part of our everyday lives. We tell stories, we begin to speak, we communicate, we want people to know what we remember. We look for clues about what we fear we might forget. Increasingly, we use a range of technologies that have become commonplace to document, share, and explore the world around us, and we attempt to share that. And I find that idea interesting. I also find it interesting to consider, alongside this notion of the gulliverization of technology, as discussed by Erki Hutamu. He basically, uh, I won't read it because it's quite long, but he talks uh, about the way that large-scale technology in public spaces uh, kind of t uh, it acts as a giant over us and also how we then can be giants over or can lord over our smaller technologies. And there's some really interesting thought that he has put into talking about the relationship with these massive screens and with these intimate screens and the interactions. And I like thinking about that because in critical terms... It leads to uh, thinking about notions, again, of materiality. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, media materiality and kind of archaeologies are sorts of forensics. And so through all of this, I'm interested in the question of narrative. Not necessarily the stories we tell, but the narrative threads, the rivers, the paths. And perhaps exploring those and the way that those function, the way that they are disrupted, rerouted, and interrupted might allow different configurations of, of information to emerge w and different stories or possibilities for each person. And so perhaps my work is now about objects and their inscribed meanings, and perhaps it is about possibility and loss, but I think above all, it is about the spaces and the places of our lives and the interactions with each other and with material objects and the way that in looking at both of those, we are able to see more about ourselves. That's